There is a very interesting discussion to be had about how the internet has distorted the traditional pathways to fame and has allowed individuals to become recognized solely for their hobbies and passions in a way that were once unimaginable. This digital age has created a new path to recognition. The global reach of sites like YouTube have effectively eliminated geographical barriers, allowing individuals to achieve fame and success by showcasing their unique interests and talents on online platforms. However, as we tread this path, we must approach it with a keen awareness of the associated challenges. The true success should be measured not only in popularity but also in one's personal well-being, resilience and the authenticity of their digital persona. The internet may be a gateway to new possibilities but it is our responsibility to ensure that the price of recognition does not outweigh its benefits. One particular content creator undoubtedly recognized the steep toll that the internet could exact but, regrettably, this awareness came far too late for him. This this tragic story finds its embodiment in the case of Noah Entweiler, better recognized by his online moniker, the Spoonie One. A once prominent member in the realm of online reviews, Spoonie One's journey is a compelling narrative of initial success, subsequent struggles and the devastating impact of mental health issues on his life and career. His work in the online sphere showcased the calamity that can befell one's life due to internet fame. The audience you amass and the friendships you forge during your journey should not be taken for granted. This this is because, once everyone leaves, you will come to realize that basking in the spotlight for far too long can render you incapable of living without it. If you have two CD-ROM drives, Secron decides that you're trying to copy the game or run an image. In the mid-2000s, YouTube was rapidly evolving into a flourishing platform for content creators, offering a space for everyday individuals to share their hobbies and interests. In this digital landscape, a specific group of people, known as online reviewers, started to surface and gain prominence. In the early days of YouTube reviews, authenticity reigned supreme. Reviewers often worked with minimal resources, recording their videos in humble settings such as their bedrooms or makeshift studios. The only really unfortunate thing about Metal Storm is that I don't have anybody to share my enthusiasm with. I mean, it's sad, but Metal Storm was a game that was completely overlooked, left behind and forgotten. Unlike polished productions seen in traditional media, these videos lacked the layer of professionalism. Instead, they were raw, unfiltered and unapologetically real. This honest look gave viewers a sense of relatability, as they watched content creators who were just like them, expressing their passion in an unpretentious manner. Naturally, the first person that comes to mind when we reminisce about this period is Angry Video Game Nerd. James Rolfe's humorous and often fierce reviews of retro video games, accompanied by creative sketches and harsh language, captured the attention of rapidly expanding online audience. This, in turn, inspired a wave of motivated content creators who tried to replicate his distinctive style. Some blatantly attempted to plagiarize AVGN, recycling many of his jokes and often feeling like inferior copies of the original. Others, however, adopted his style but infused their own creative twists, thus creating this distinctive and unique personalities. In keeping with the AVGN-inspired style, these early reviewers often focused on niche aspects of pop culture, including retro video games, obscure movies or forgotten TV shows. They dove deep into the realms of nostalgia, sometimes unearthing hidden gems but often reveling in the absurdity and frustration of forgotten titles. In many ways, those were much simpler times, with many of these online personalities pursuing their interests purely for fun. This passion was evidently contagious, given the large and dedicated audience that gathered to watch their content. As more and more AVGN-inspired reviewers began to emerge, a massive explosion of videos of the same nature occurred on YouTube and other video-sharing platforms. This period marked the birth of many internet personalities, who have since gained fame and built successful 
successful careers based on their early contributions. In this vast array of creators, one individual will be the focus of our discussion, and his name is Noah Entweiler. Noah created his YouTube channel in July of 2006, but it wasn't until January of 2007 that he released his first video. Right from the start, Noah's inspirations were immediately revealed. He openly acknowledged that this video might bear resemblance to other content creators of similar nature, but instead of being a copycat, he wanted to produce something unique. Video game reviews like The Angry Video Game Nerd and RMIG21. I love those guys to death, and I'm not necessarily trying to steal their thunder. What I am trying to do, however, is to share with you one particular game that forever darkened my childhood and probably contributed a great deal to making me the psychological mess that I am today. He had a desire to create this video based on one of his childhood memories. This first introduction of Spoonie One to the World was a review of the NES game called Adventures of Bayou Billy. The structure of the said review was something you might expect from someone who was inspired by AVGN. He presented segments featuring game footage he had recorded on an emulator, as well as live action inserts of him playing the game while narrating his experience. By today's standards, the video may appear quite amateurish and lacking in depth. However, However, back then it managed to garner a substantial number of views on his newly established channel. Spoonie exuded an aura of simplicity and honesty that was characteristic of many content creators at the time, and perhaps it was this genuine quality that drew audiences in. We're gonna get out of here, and there's Mr. Big. He's like, Oh, I see you beat up my atta attack helicopter. Well, I got hundreds more. Uh huh. I tied up your girlfriend. I'm gonna give her to the Gimp. Mm hmm. I guarantee she's gonna suffer. His online persona was also charismatic and relatable. He had a way of connecting with his audience through his candid and unscripted moments. He came across as a genuine and down-to-earth individual who shared the same frustrations and joys as his viewers when it came to this obscure game he discussed. Having received some attention from this video, Noah decided to produce even more reviews for other NES games, including titles like Samurai Zombie Nation, Heroes of the Lands and Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. The way you get out of there, you just go up through the door. I thought that was the door you just came in. I didn't know you were supposed to go through that. Now, this is what the meat of the game, the combat. Check this out. There's no hit detection. It's totally broken. These videos that Noah created during this period played an important role in establishing a solid foothold for him on the online platform. With each upload, he garnered a respectable audience, a community that appreciated his distinctive approach. This early content laid the foundation for the Spoonie One persona that is recognized today. This persona became known for his quick wit and sarcastic humor, distinguished by clever wordplay and sharp observations. These qualities became hallmarks of his style, setting him apart in the ever-growing landscape of online content creators. The obvious passion that Spoonie expressed for the content he produced significantly contributed to his early success. ...to fight the evil sheriff of Nottingham, Hans Gruber. Right. I mean, people may bitch and moan about how they didn't like how the new Kevin Costner movie came out, but let me tell you something. It dispensed with everything that dragged Robin Hood down over the years, like humor, swashbuckling adventure, British accents, and Prince John. The next significant surge in viewership, which firmly established him as a legitimate content creator, came from his comprehensive review of Final Fantasy VIII. At the time, this in-depth analysis spanned across seven videos, making an important moment in Spoonie One's online journey. Final Fantasy VIII divided the fans for almost a decade at that point. The game marked a departure from some of the traditional elements of the previous series, and this led to diverse opinions among both critics and players. In other words, the perfect subject matter for the video style that Noah was known for. And uh, you know, this is where I really started taking issue with the game, because after you do this, Quistus starts like uh, giving you tutorials on every single thing in the game, and it's so involved. They changed everything from the ground up, and they made it, made it so needlessly abstract and complicated that this is just the beginning of it. You have to link your magic to your given attributes, and the different kinds of magic you link to your different attributes increase them in different ways.
It was obvious that his enthusiasm wasn't merely performative, it was a genuine reflection of his love for the subject matter, resonating strongly with the viewers who shared similar interests. As Noah continued to navigate the digital realm, it became increasingly apparent that he had huge potential, capable of surpassing even those individuals who initially inspired him to start making videos. Spooning One's journey up to this point not only reflects his talent, but also serves as a testament to the impact that genuine passion and the unique voice can have in the ever-evolving landscape of online content creation. It would be good to highlight that during this period Spoonie wasn't solely creating video game reviews. He also provided commentary on audio CDs and other obscure media that captivated his interest. In addition to this, he crafted more personalized videos where Noah addressed questions commonly posed by his fans. Beyond media-related content, he shared various aspects of who he is as a person, including explicit detail that he faced some challenges in his life. He had struggled with unemployment and was living with his parents when he began his online content creation. These early stages of his YouTube career coincided with a period where he was navigating through various life circumstances. Despite these challenges, his YouTube channel eventually gained popularity. In mid-2008, Spoonie was hovering around 6,000 subscribers, a respectable number considering how young YouTube was at the time. However, Spoonie would soon find himself in the forefront of a massive storm that was about to sweep through the platform. In 2007, Viacom filed a lawsuit against Google, the parent company of YouTube, for copyright infringement. Viacom, a media conglomerate that owns various entertainment properties, alleged that YouTube was hosting and distributing copyrighted content without proper authorization. This legal dispute gained significant attention as it raised questions about the responsibilities of online platforms regarding uploaded media clips and copyright protection. The case highlighted the challenges of managing copyrighted material on a platform driven by user-generated content. The litigation continued until 2010 when the court granted summary judgment in favor of Google, stating that YouTube was protected by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. In spite of that, court proceedings lasted nearly three years and during that time this lawsuit had a significant impact on the platform, with the online review community being the first in the line of fire. Many channels during that time received copyright strikes and some, such as RMake21, were even suspended. Needless to say, it created a huge shitstorm and this once vibrant community began to confront the genuine possibility of completely halting content creation due to this new threat. Noah was also among these impacted online reviewers having received three copyright strikes. This meant that he was on the brink of losing a channel he had been building for almost two years. The video you are currently watching features him addressing the severity of the situation. And the latest casualty, uh, the angry video game nerd, also suspended for various reasons. Now, I don't know why, I have no explanation or reasoning behind the rationale. I think it's just YouTube going after as many copyright infringements as they can and, and cutting them off. That being said, uh, I'm putting this video up because I may not be around on YouTube much longer. Um, I think even I can see the handwriting on the wall. It seems like YouTube has gone to war on its uh, video game reviewers, and I am the last of the Mohicans, so to speak. There are not many of us left. The unfortunate reality is that remaining on YouTube was not feasible for the foreseeable future. At that time, Spoonie had his own website called SpoonieExperiment.com where he posted his videos. Hence, it appeared logical to transition from YouTube to this site to avoid potential suspensions. Looking at it now, this threat looming on the horizon might have been a blessing in disguise as the community that was most affected discovered a way to forge new alliances. During that time, another emerging YouTuber by the name of Nostalgia Critic was gaining popularity and the continuous stream of copyright strikes was impacting his channel as well. The Nostalgia Critic is an online persona created by Doug Walker who gained recognition on YouTube by creating humorous and critical reviews of nostalgic movies and TV shows, particularly those from the 80s and the 90s. 
We're fine. It's just some psychosomatic deal or something to do with the moon or the lime or the planet. Wow, it looks like they took their acting talent too. Similar to Spoony One, nostalgic critics' comedic style combined by energetic and exaggerated reactions help make the reviews entertaining and engaging. During the great YouTube purge of online reviews, he also encouraged his audience to transition from YouTube to his newly established website called Dead Guy with the Glasses. This site was co-founded by Mike Mashad, Mike Ellis and Doug Walker and was envisioned as a space where creators could share their passion for dissecting and humorously critiquing nostalgic media. And thus, many in the community who had been wrongfully targeted by copyright strikes were invited to join the site, contributing to its ever-growing circle of creators. As you may have guessed, Spoonie was one of the people who were invited and was among the first creators to join. Hello everybody! I'm making this video mainly to uh, reintroduce myself to uh, all of my new YouTube subscribers, but also to say hello to everyone at thatguywiththeglasses.com, a place I was recently invited to, a place I'm very happy to share my videos with. But uh, many of you may not know me, so I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about myself. From that point forward, he consistently generated content while refining his craft. His presence in the digital sphere expanded significantly, making him one of the most acknowledged contributors to that guy with the glasses, even amidst a growing influx of creators to the site. All of the aspects we know about this character were developed and improved during this period. Spoonie exhibited engaging and captivating on-screen presence. His delivery was entertaining, and his ability to forge connections with the audience fostered a strong sense of community. Clever commentary and humorous observations added an entertaining layer to his videos. If you've ever came across Spoonie One, it was likely around this period, because it was here that he created some of his most beloved content. Videos like his are Alone in the Dark review and the review of your Hunter from the Future, along with a diverse range of content such as vlogs and his insights into Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition catapulted him to great lengths of popularity. And I said, uh, let's wait and see uh, what it's like. So I've waited, I've played a few games with, uh, with a group, so I'm going to tell you what I think. And I'm going to need to flip through the book a little bit just to organize my thoughts, because I'm just talking about this kind of off the cuff. Notably, he even maintained a consistent upload schedule, regularly delivering content, sometimes even outputting multiple videos in a single week. In October of 2008, Noah began a relationship with a woman named Scarlett, who quickly became acquainted with his videos. As December approached, so did Christmas and Noah's birthday, so Scarlett decided to present him with a unique gift. She offered to redesign his website and assist in setting up advertising. From that point forward, she assumed the role of the webmaster for SpoonyExperiment.com. This transition significantly boosted the site's revenue, enabling Noah to fully commit to content creation. As you can see, Scarlett played a pivotal role in shaping Spooniman's life and influencing his online presence. Later on, she also helped in filming some of his videos. While his reviews took center stage, Spoonie also produced a diverse array of videos covering commentary on movies, TV shows and various other media. The most notable content from that time was his gameplay of the game Phantasmagoria 2, which is still one of his most beloved series. Till now, nothing happens, but uh, here's the one time on the fifth disc that it does work. No way you live, Mirror. No way. Being a member of that guy with the glasses also showcased its advantages as Spoonie collaborated with fellow creators on the site, such as Linkara, Cinema Snub, and Doug Walker himself. One of the most popular crossovers involving Spoonie One was Nostalgia Critics' reviews of Uwe Ball movies. You guys are so dramatic. Yeah. This collaborative effort expanded the scope of his persona and introduced viewers to a broader array of perspectives within the reviewer circle. It was, in many regards, a golden age for Spoonie One, a period of prolific content creation, widespread recognition and a thriving online community. During this era, he became known for his engaging and over-exaggerating style, producing a variety of content that resonated with a diverse audience. This time of abundance was also followed by challenges and changes in his online career. While some still speculate about the causes that led up to the upcoming events, the downfall that follows is still genuinely disturbing to witness.
If you happened to visit SpoonyExperiment.com around 2009, you would soon find yourself questioning whether Noah ever consulted a doctor for his extremely thin skin. On his site, Spoony banned people almost daily, especially those who expressed any form of harsh words or criticism. And let me tell you, there definitely was a lot of criticism, largely stemming from Noah's consistent uploading of videos that garnered little attention or interest from his audience. One of the most notorious series was Wrestle Wrestle, where Spoonie devolved into discussion about professional wrestling. The logic here... <laughs> okay, so you can beat a man mercilessly with a chair. You can, you can pound a man with a steel folding chair into unconsciousness. You can beat him beyond recognition. There's no disqualifications for this. You can murder the man with a chair, and that's fine. But you punched him in the sack. Oh no, that we, we can't have that. <laughs> the critique mainly revolved around his misuse of time, as these videos were diverting his focus from creating the reviews that served as a primary attraction to his channel. Despite facing massive criticism, Spoonie doubled down in his decision to create content according to his personal preferences. This pattern becomes increasingly obvious as you devolve deeper into his body of work. Fans of Spoonie One consistently found themselves in the back seat and faced repercussions if they dared to voice their discontent. Given that his girlfriend assumed the role of webmaster for the site, she mainly handled the banning of individuals, meaning she also became a target of significant amounts of hate. It was easy to see that this carefully constructed facade that this upstart YouTuber created was slowly starting to crack. He definitely didn't improve the situation with his deranged posts, with one of the most notable ones centering around the Open Web Awards. Just to provide some context, the Open Web Awards was an annual online competition designed to acknowledge exceptional achievements across various categories in the online and social media realm. In 2009, Spoonie secured a victory in the funniest person to follow category. It's important to highlight that the Open Web Awards held significant prestige at the time, and being presented with an award was considered a noteworthy achievement. Rather than celebrating, Spoonie created a post titled An Appeal for Manners where he showed just how fragile his ego truly was. I debated with myself a long time on whether or not to post anything about this matter. I thought I might be feeding the trolls, but I think this needs to be addressed. First of all, thank you all for the extraordinary support and well wishes this year that helped me to win the Open Web Awards for the funniest person of the year. That said, the celebration is tainted a great deal for me because we have few bad eggs out there who continue to post cruel and hateful things on the blog and on the forums. I am very, very upset right now. In fact, some of the comments lately have left me completely outraged. And I know that I'm only addressing a scant few people out there. I have thousands and thousands of fans, almost all of whom are astoundingly generous, kind and supportive. It sucks that I have to stop the press, drag the whole party down and give these cowards the attention they don't deserve. This post was so pathetic that many people were wondering what Spoonie was thinking when he posted it. Despite many unhinged responses to internet comments, Spoonie still demonstrated his ability to create captivating videos, because in 2010 he began the Ultima retrospective. This collection of video reviews presents comprehensive and engaging analysis of each game in the Ultima franchise, devolving into aspects such as gameplay, storytelling and their broader impact on the the role-playing game genre. The introduction of the eight virtues and their interconnection with the three principles of truth, love, and courage was a great framework for the Avatar, a champion of morality that actually remains secular, invoking purity and goodness without really bringing a god into the equation. It's a good system. It's easy to understand, and judging from the moral choices made in Ultima 4, a cinch to live by. You know, don't lie, don't murder, defend the weak, and be charitable to the downtrodden, all that crap. But what nobody expected, however, was how Richard Garriott would warp and twist his own creation. And in each game to follow, you can see him taking a perverse pleasure in showing us how the same virtues and its champion can save a world, but also doom it. Regarded as his most distinguished work, the Ultima Retrospective comprises over 19 videos, accumulating nearly 5 hours of footage. It is evident that Spoonie held a profound love for the Ultima series, leading him to organize a peculiar online competition.
In Ultima 3 Exodus, one of the enemies happens to be the floor, triggering a comical reaction from Spoonie. But even with such potent magics at your disposal, the final century before you face Exodus himself is by far your deadliest and most nefarious foe yet, a lethal, unseen killer that all living mortals must one day face. The floor! Yeah, the floor attacks you. This is what it looks like. To commemorate the moment, he organized an event encouraging people to upload their own humorous skits centered around the concept of battling the floor, more specifically, the grass. However, this initiative sparked controversy as Spoonie simply uploaded these user-created videos to his site, generating revenue with minimal effort on his part. Despite the numerous flaws associated with Noah, he was still massively adored online. It appeared that the already mentioned setbacks were not sufficient to threaten his presence. It's crucial to understand that, at the time, Noah wasn't merely some guy posting reviews on the internet. He actively attended conventions and panels alongside other members of that guy with the glasses, slowly evolving into something of an internet celebrity. It is needless to say that many fans attended these events to see him in person. Behind the scenes, the situation with the Viacom lawsuit was starting to calm down, so members of that guy with the glasses migrated back to YouTube under the umbrella of Channel Awesome, an online media production company, with Doug Walker serving as the face of the business. This meant that many online reviewers were slowly beginning to return to the platform, and Spoonie was no exception. He continued to post his reviews and other videos, maintaining his status as one of the most recognized creators. In February of 2011, Scarlett and Spoonie broke up, dealing a substantial blow to him personally and professionally. Scarlett played a pivotal role in maintaining Spoonie's sight, but after this separation, she completely cut off her involvement with SpooniExperiment.com. Noah didn't take this breakup very well. He underwent something we might call a depressive state. Even after many years, he would still mention Scarlett in tweets or in real life in a negative manner. It was almost something like a catalyst for the deteriorating mental state that was about to arrive. Both of these were entirely improv on the spot, and that's not to say we didn't have several takes, but, you know, basically they, they're telling me, like, oh, we're going to do the spoony with spoony thing, put your smoking jacket on, and of course I had to borrow the ass that guy robe, but... Additional challenges emerged as Spoonie's association with Channel Awesome began to reveal its downsides. Like I said before, Channel Awesome members had a habit of collaborating on each other's videos, a tradition that was initially established during their exile from YouTube. Initially, these group efforts contributed to a sense of community and provided an opportunity for various creators to attract new fans. Unfortunately, at this point in time, this trend seemed more troublesome than beneficial. Firstly, the relevance of Channel Awesome and that guy with the glasses had diminished, as YouTube had become the primary platform for the majority of its content creators. For Spoonie, these collaborative works only served to consume more time that could have been devoted to making reviews. Channel Awesome also produced a series of anniversary movies that were special collaborative projects involving many of its contributors. These movies were typically released around the anniversary of the creation of Channel Awesome and featured various content creators associated with the platform. Spoonie, of course, participated in all three projects. If you thought that collaborating on a small video review took time from his schedule, you can only imagine the significant amount of time he invested being involved in three full-blown films. The the most disappointing fact was that after all of that, he had very little to show for it. These anniversary movies were mediocre at best and outright terrible at worst. Additionally, several years later, an anonymous Fortune user claimed to be an insider who supposedly worked on set for Kikasia, Channel's awesome first film. This individual revealed a substantial amount of information about people associated with that guy with the glasses, particularly how much they are socially inept behind the scenes. Regarding the movie production, they emphasized how amateurish it all appeared, while at the same time most of the people on set were acting like they were making a masterpiece. There were also alleged reports of conflict between Spoonie One and Doug Walker, as Insider wrote, I wish I had more Spoonie stories, but the dude was MIA most of the time. I saw some good fallout from one. Doug and scientist Spoonie have a fight scene that I wasn't at and apparently Spoonie played too rough and ripped Doug's M. Bison cape. 
the two got into a fight that was bad enough that no one would tell me the details of. The next day I shot with them and they refused to look at each other or do anything other than grumble. When Spoonie's scene was done, Doug told Rob that Spoonie was being unprofessional. Lesson, it's unprofessional to rip a 30 year old man's M. Bison costume cape while play fighting for a low budget movie. At the end of the day, everyone will draw their own conclusions about these films. You might see them as cringy and goofy, but in a sense they showcased the collaborative spirit within the Channel Awesome community. Whether this aspect was positive or negative for Spoonie's career, it pales in comparison to what is about to unfold next. In May of 2012, Noah made a tweet directed at Jesu Otaku, another associate of that guy with the glasses. At Jesu Otaku, you know, if things don't work out with you and Nash76, I'd be happy to chain you to a pipe in my basement and love you. My way. It is hard to imagine that this single tweet had initiated a huge chain reaction, triggering a cascade of events that had a severe impact on Spoonie One. To truly understand what I am talking about, let's examine the things that happened after that. Another Channel Awesome member at the time, Obscurus Lupa, responded to Spoonie. At the Spoonie One. That's not even funny creepy. This triggered a back and forth discussion on Twitter between Spoonie and this individual with following comments. Man, that's messed up when a woman screws you up so bad you wish you were a dog. Seriously, I can't follow you anymore, dude. Ah, uh, Obscurist Lupa hates me now too, gonna have to bust out the Adele playlist for this breakup. You joked about chaining Hope up in your basement and roping her, I got no sympathy for you. After this discussion, Noah made a series of tweets addressing the controversy and some of them were as follows. Is that punishment harsh enough for scum as loathsome as me? I really don't know what else I need to do, I've apologized, I've begged. Is it blood you want? Tears. Oh my god, I was rude to a co-worker and somehow the world still exists, how can that be? I beg forgiveness, knowing full well I wouldn't be worth pissing on if my face was on fire. As you can see, this situation was really messy and I've only shown you small pieces of it. Other people also got involved and the entire thing turned into a dumpster fire. Some individuals criticized Spoonie for making inappropriate comments while others targeted Obscurus Lupa for exaggerating the situation. To conclude this absolute train wreck, not even a month after this Twitter exchange, a post was created on that guy with the glasses website titled A Farewell to Spoonie One, announcing that Noah Entweiler would no longer be a contributor to Channel Awesome. The post stated, after recent events, Noah, the Spoonie One Entweiler and Channel Awesome have decided to part ways. Noah has made it clear that he wishes to pursue a course that is different from our own. We feel that with these different aims, it is better for Noah to be free to pursue his own goals unhindered by us. Noah has been an immense talent on the site and we thank him for his years of hard service. Both in numerous episodes of the Spoonie Experiment and in the Channel Awesome Anniversary films. We sincerely wish him the best in all future endeavors and hope he continues to put out great quality work. Staff at Channel Awesome. To this day, it is widely believed that Spoonie's initial tweet caused the chain reaction of events that eventually led to his removal from Channel Awesome. However, Spoonie later stated that Lupa wasn't the one who got him fired. Instead, it was a mutual agreement between Channel Awesome and him to part ways. I suppose that I should uh, address the pink elephant in the room by talking about my departure from Channel Awesome something that uh, has been kept mostly under wraps. Uh, you know, as with anything, it's a very complicated issue, and it's not just one thing. I, I can tell you one thing. Uh, the people kind of settled on the theory that Lupa got me fired somehow for making a joke on Twitter. If you don't know, I made a rather poor taste joke on Twitter that offended Lupa, and um, that was not what got me quote unquote fired and it didn't really stem you know my departure it wasn't any it wasn't like that it didn't help but that wasn't why in many ways i just didn't need channel awesome anymore i i just didn't uh, in the sense that it was a really one-sided relationship um again don't get me wrong i loved working for these guys and these movies that i've done with them are some of the best work I've ever done, and I'm very proud to have done it. 
It is advisable not to take this statement at face value, considering the glaring timing between this Twitter argument and his departure from the site. Despite what the reason for parting ways might have been, something peculiar began to unfold after this announcement. Some members of Channel Awesome started displaying vindictive behavior towards Spoonie One. The most noteworthy statements came from a man named Jason Polora, also known as Lord Cat. Not even two weeks after Noah's departure, he shared his opinion on the matter during his podcast Lord Cat Live. I no longer respect Noah Antweiler. I used to respect him because I felt he put a lot of work into his videos. He put a lot of work into getting to where he was. And I thought he was a funny guy. I thought he was original, I thought he was innovative, and I thought he deserved to be where he was. Where he was. And I no longer see that. And I am sitting here today telling you, Noah Antweiler, you need to give up. You don't have what it takes to be successful. You don't have what it takes to be popular. You are the second most loathsome person I've ever had the displeasure of knowing. You're on the level of the amazing atheist. You are that unpleasant to be around. You shit all over your fans, and then you shit on my fans. You are the worst thing to happen to that guy with the glasses. Now, I am breaking my agreement here with that guy with the glasses by discussing this. But I think it's time the whole world, Spoonie, heard just how much of a fucking idiot you truly are. You and that other idiot, Joe. When you were at E3 that one year, and you decided to go up and down the hallways screaming about XCOM's betrayal... Betrayal! What? Betrayal! Betrayed me! This game sucks! And Joe decided to ask people, can I choke you on camera? Guess what happened? Spoonie. The whole gaming industry turned its back on me. Not you, not Joe, not blistered thumbs, me. I went to GDC the following year, and I had a chance to interview Notch, Mojang, Specifications, Minecraft. He was hot then. That was going to be huge for this week in games. That was going to be huge for the stream. It was going to be amazing. And you know what happened? The representative at Mojang caught wind that we were going to interview Notch. And he stepped in. And he said, oh, I've heard of you. You're with that guy with the glasses. You're with Blister Thumbs. And I tried to tell them, no, I'm not. But he said my name was associated with them. And he heard what you did. So they shot it down. They thought I was the guy at E3 making a jackass of everyone. I was there trying to be a legitimate member of the business of the gaming industry. And I've worked my ass off to separate myself from you. Every time. You just don't get it. In the upcoming wave of negativity, another video featuring Lord Cut began to gain attention. This particular clip showcased Spoonie joining a call where some of his colleagues were playing Dungeons and & Dragons, and during this interaction he had another spasm for some inexplicable reason. Why did you come in? To tell you guys you're being really You came in the call Jason. just to shit on this. <laughs> oh, like any- like you're shitting I, on this we're game just any joking more than you with are, Jason. Chris. Why do you have to come in and shit on this? Like we're like we're lashing out at him. Jason was laughing. All right. Um. Listen, we have an encounter here. All right. I'm out. I'm out. Having gone through a breakup with his girlfriend and being let go from Channel Awesome, it was undoubtedly tough for Spoonie to endure the criticism from his former colleagues. Not to mention, all of these problems unfolded within just over a year. However, despite these setbacks, Spoonie demonstrated his resilience. He showcased that he still possessed the passion and talent to create content. In early 2013, he uploaded his most famous video to date, a review of Ultima 9 Ascension featuring a heartfelt monologue on what the Ultima series meant to him. New thing, it was this monochrome computer. Uh, five and a quarter inch floppies. And uh, my older brother and I would play on it. And we only had one game. It was probably the first game, probably the first computer game I ever played. And that was, it was Ultima 3. 
I didn't play the earlier ones until a lot later, but yeah, we played Ultima 3. And um, my brother would play it with me, and he, he taught me how to play. He'd, he'd let me play it on my own. He'd let me play his characters on my own, and let me level them up, and, you know, just get gold, because you needed gold, you know, get the exotic weapons and stuff like that. And he didn't get mad if I got his characters killed, and I did that a lot. And he put a lot of time, we all put a lot of time into this, but, you know, I, I was three or four you know it's gonna happen we we played like all the, we played everything we played ultima 4 and i was older of course and he helped me understand the story and how it was different and what i was doing and um i, I don't know if you believe that's basically how i learned to read was the ultima games and he'd play that game with me because he was cool like that and whenever i think of uh whenever i think of him that's that's what i think of and i miss that yeah. I miss fighting the floor in Ultima 3. It served as an unmistakable reminder that Spoonie was still in the game. In many cases, cutting ties with Channel Awesome seemed more like a benefit, freeing him from many collaborative projects. Moreover, he started a new relationship with a woman named April, whom he featured in his vlog videos, including movie retrospections. He continued to attend panels, engage in Q&A sessions, and was still generally well-liked within the YouTube community. With his elevated status, Noah decided to launch a Patreon campaign in April of 2014. At the time, it proved to be one of the most successful Patreon fundraisers I had ever seen. His supporters were paying him almost $5,000 per month, making an incredible success. It highlighted the extent of Spoonie's loyal audience at the time. One might assume that things could only go up from that point onward. Unfortunately, that assumption would be sorely mistaken. The first sign of trouble started when Noah needed to explain some of his Patreon goals, with the most notable one being the creation of a Spoonie One movie. Somehow, just, you guys have reached the uh, the Patreon goal where uh, it was listed that I would start work on a movie, and I was just I I was blown away by this. <laughs> it was like you guys are the best fans in the world. Oh my god, this movie has not been written yet, obviously. Um, and I also haven't decided what the movie will be about. I have three or four ideas that I'm kicking around. Uh, that, very, very good ideas. But, um, here's the interesting thing. None of them are what you would call, uh, uh spoony movies. I, I didn't really envision, like, a, a in-character spoony movie when I was thinking of, of a movie. And, um, hopefully that wasn't misleading. Maybe it was. And I'm not ruling it out. The video addressing this topic received so much hate that he had to disable the comments, something he found himself doing more frequently due to the way he conducted himself in recent times. The audience's disdain with Spoonie for his blatant lies about the movie he was supposed to create was just the tip of the iceberg, because as time progressed, none of the Patreon goals he promised were fulfilled. These unmet expectations included things like DVDs or streams featuring Noah playing cards against humanity. Unfortunately, this wasn't the end of his crippling laziness. Even before his Patreon launch, around mid-2013, it became obvious that Spoonie was producing considerably fewer reviews, which were the essence of his channel. Instead, he decided to concentrate on videos that demanded far less effort. The best example would be his so-called review of Bioshock Infinite, where he simply monologued in front of a camera for an hour and a half without a hint of editing. Following the success of his Patreon, this trend unfortunately became increasingly apparent, with Noah producing very little engaging content by the year 2015. His audience grew more agitated due to his apparent disregard for the financial support they were providing. Despite receiving a substantial amount of money, he seemed to be doing very little. He failed to communicate with his Patreons, did not fulfill any of the promised Patreon goals and showed no signs of producing any meaningful content. Soon, the support and encouragement from the fans began to dwindle, and they were certainly going to make their voices heard. I've gotta say, Spoonie, I begged because you were my favorite online video person for a while, but you have really fallen. No content in so long. 
I'm sorry to say this, but I'm pulling funding until I see more. How are you making more than Cinema Snub when he puts out quality videos every week is beyond me. I feel like I should add to this thread as well as I am a highest tier supporter who jumped off. I am very sorry for that and would truly much rather see you, Spoonie, not just enjoy everyone's support, but also continue to, with full motivation, create the great content you always come up with. For justifying my $100 pledge, I wouldn't even need the Cards Against Humanity game or any other personalized kind of perk at all, I'd just like to see you create content. Currently, things seem to have slowed down, which makes it hard to justify $100 per month that have no visible effect when there are others out there that also deserve part of my Patreon budget. Like the other posters, I really hope I will soon be able to change my mind and support you again. Hey man, I've been a huge supporter of yours going all the way back to Reaper, but I just can't justify pledging $50 a month anymore. I mean most, if not all of the content has been vlogs and for like the last 3 months it's basically been 3 parts of the same video. I was looking really forward to receiving the $50 reward, but it's been nearly a year. I wanted to ask you if you had any status updates on that stuff, so I actually created a Twitter account and asked you on there, and sent you an email to you as well. But that was several weeks ago and I didn't hear anything. Since this is essentially the only other place where I can leave any comments, I just wanted to let you know. I feel really bad about dropping my support, but I felt it would be honest if I let you know first. I'm still going to follow the content you put out and wish you all the best. Thanks. As you can see, his audience wasn't vindictive or angry, they were just profoundly disappointed with what has transpired with Spoony One. Despite getting their hard-earned money, he somehow produced even less videos than before. There was one place where Noah was the most active and that was his Twitter. He posted constantly hundreds and hundreds of tweets about a wide array of topics. We could even say he was addicted to it, considering he also created an account where he acted like his dog. I beg your pardon? So please, let's consider this. July of 2016 marked the last time he posted anything on his Patreon. So Noah doesn't find the time to update the people supporting him with money, but he does have the time to roleplay as his dog on Twitter. That must be disgusting heartening. If there ever was a financial domination, this seems to be it. What's worse, that's not even the end of it. Instead of making an effort and, at the very least, create edited reviews, he began his Live Wire series, which were basically live streams of him playing various video games. It was extremely bare bone, with Spoonie barely speaking anything during the gameplay. You can already imagine how well received these streams were when you take a look at the abysmally low viewership. The few people who did tune in often antagonized him, questioning when genuine content would be released rather than this low effort garbage. To show you just how atrocious these live streams were, Spoony One actually got his own This Is How You Don't Play episode, an honor that was previously only reserved for Snort Burnell. His Alien Isolation gameplay has become widely regarded as one of the worst pieces of content Noah has ever published. Throughout this charade, he was extremely toxic towards both the game itself and the people in the chat. You have to see this to believe it. Okay, dude, I'm not switching to my pistol. It's not going to work! Well, I'm sorry I'm not narrating every single solitary second of my existence in this game, you guys. I apologize if I'm not that interesting when I'm trying to sneak and concentrate. It does work, don't know what happened. So, basically, there's four versions... There's four stories I'm hearing in the chat room, which means minimum three of you are full of shit. That's great. 
This stream was so bad that Spoonie deleted it from his channel, but not before people archived it so they could make fun of him on Reddit. Notice his attitude towards people interacting with him in the chat or how salty he becomes whenever he loses the game. Worst of all, this wasn't an isolated incident. It was easy to notice that here Spoonie wasn't at all the person we know. He wasn't funny, goofy or charming, he was the complete opposite. In this live stream environment there was no second chance for him to re record his behavior as he did in edited videos. In streaming, what you see is what you get, and unfortunately what you got is pretty bad. If one more person says to use the pistol, I'm banning you. I'm just gonna ban you! Even before his departure from Channel Awesome, Noah consistently exhibited disdain to any form of harsh opinion. It wasn't that hard to notice how all of the increasing criticism directed at his Patreon, his work and his horrible behavior had the effect on his ego. Let's take a look at another bizarre stream featuring Spoonie where he played Doom 2016. To grasp what is about to unfold, you need some backstory. You see, Noah has a younger brother named Miles who serves as a sheriff's Deputy. During this time, Miles fatally shot a criminal and an illegal immigrant named Felipe Ramirez when the said criminal attempted to shoot him. The entire situation was really messy, but ultimately Miles was regarded as a hero for taking down a truly dangerous individual involved in various shady activities. This incident soon became associated with Noah and a new trend, Juan but not forgotten, started appearing in the comment section of his streams. Some people began to goof on the entire situation, much to the dismay of Spoonie. This brings us to the aforementioned Doom stream. Instead of appearing completely miserable in front of the camera, as he usually did, he actually seemed to have fun playing the game. That was until the trend involving his brother started getting on his nerves. He then decided to pause the game to deliver this bizarre monologue. Okay. I'll, I'll address the one but not forgotten thing. I feel like doing that now. For some reason, I don't know who, is bringing up this incident where my brother, who is a sheriff's deputy, was involved in a fatal shooting. Uh, the suspect in question, he was called out to deal with a domestic, a domestic abuse call. The suspect, when, he, when Miles pulled up, the suspect emerged from the house, uh, got into his car, and when ordered to stop, attempted to run Miles over with his car twice. This was not an unprovoked shoot. It had nothing to do with racism. He tried to kill Miles three times before he opened fire. And you keep bringing it up like it bothers me. It bothers me in the sense that you are so ill-informed that you're coming after me with it. it ins you know, you're trying to insult my brother like your opinion matters for shit. Watching the deteriorating persona of Spoonie One was like observing a candle that is slowly melting. Many who were watching this spectacle found themselves asking what in the world happened. By the year of 2017, these live streams were the only content Spoonie was producing. These depressing cesspits where he barely found the strength to record his gameplay represented the extent of his efforts on YouTube. Eventually, a significant portion of his audience turned their backs on him and by the end of that year, this is what his Patreon looked like. This was the money Spoonie was making, from $5,000 down to $500. In just three short years, Spoonie managed to plummet his career into the ground. But when you think about it, even even that 500 is too much when you consider that he is getting 500 dollars doing nothing. Forget the Spoonie One movie, he wasn't even producing his reviews, the staple of his YouTube channel. Noah's schedule has boiled down to live streaming around 4 times a month and that was it. Yet despite all of this, he was still very active on Twitter. 
Sometimes he would average around a thousand tweets per month. During the start of this debacle, he would constantly argue with people. Typically, someone would call him out on his statements about taking a break from Twitter to focus on creating content. In response, he would reply in a fiery fashion. He simply could not let anything go. Then, there was this perplexing phase when Noah began mentioning a variety of mental and physical health problems. He tweeted about this so much that in 2016 it was almost as if Spoonie's body became something of a medical anomaly. I still wonder if his case ended up documented in some science books. This timeline where he mentioned different illnesses actually corresponds with the time he stopped making content to have spasms on Twitter and roleplay as his dog. Now, I am not suggesting that all of these issues are entirely fabricated because he needed an excuse for why his lazy ass isn't putting any effort to advance his career. I'm not saying that. That was what other people, people who followed him at the time, were saying. This would also reveal a peculiar trend. You see, there are a lot of conspiracy theories and rumors circling around Spoonie One, dating way back when he was let go from that guy with the glasses. For example, there is some talk that his firing from the company was carefully orchestrated by various members of Channel Awesome. There were also many rumors around Spoonie's and April's relationship. Some people claim that April was just a gold digger that is using Noah, while others thought she was unfaithful based on her online behavior. On the other hand, Spoonie had his own fair share of negative rumors spreading across cyberspace. If you had the misfortune of looking at Spoonie's Twitter or live streams from 2017 onward, you would encounter some of the most grim content imaginable. His downward spiral into depression wasn't helped by the fact that he was no longer making substantial income, yet the bills kept coming in. Notably, the payments for his new house that he bought for him and April to live in. There was much theorizing that in an attempt to cope with stress and negative behavior, he turned to drinking, despite being on medication for his bipolar disorder. Additionally, there was considerable speculation surrounding how he managed to buy the house, with many accusing him of stealing Patreon money meant for content creation. Keep in mind, these are simply rumors spread by people on Reddit and YouTube comments. Some of them have merit, while others are here to take piss out of Noah. Most of these outrageous rumors April would address in her post, completely dismissing them and labeling anyone spreading them as a hater. Now, it is difficult to know what is actually true. Spoonie has become such an enigma at this point that it is challenging to separate reality from fiction. One thing we can confirm is that by 2018, his mental state has deteriorated to such an extent that it was hard to watch anything he was doing at the time. His presence on Twitter has become so toxic that he got suspended because of this tweet, but was later reinstated. Believe me, that was the least of his worries, because the financial situation had gone from bad to worse. Low viewership combined with the abysmally small amount of money he was making on Patreon made it impossible for him to pay his bills as he was no longer earning a livable income. There was a real possibility that he might lose the house. At the same time, his website has deteriorated to such an extent that most of its functions were no longer operational. That was because no one was managing them anymore, and sometime later SpoonieExperiment.com would be shut down entirely. Generally, people believe this was because he stopped paying the hosting company for the site, so it had to be terminated. In January of 2019, Spoonie was involved in a car accident and we even have footage of that event. Okay, stay in here, stay warm until they get done. Okay. Um, you were going south? Yes. And he was going uh, west? Yes. He ran the red light? Yes. You had a green light? Yes. Okay. Subsequently, on his channel, Spoonie addressed the situation. For relevant, um, I was in a really bad car accident. Uh, I felt fine at first, um, but I started really hurting later on, which I'm told is actually kind of normal. I went to the hospital, um, uh, had like two or three broken ribs, um, uh, severe, what do they call it? Severe bruising of the chest wall. Uh, so the car was totaled, um. Had to buy a car I couldn't afford. Uh, used. There was a bunch of stuff. I had to go to court. Um, 
I was cited for the accident, uh, but long story. It was a unique experience. I learned a lot. However, in this video, he focused on describing the severe injuries he sustained, but conveniently failed to mention the fact that he was the one responsible for the accident by running the red light. Tell me what happened. Okay. I was in the right lane, and I was driving along speed limit. Um, uh, I had the I had the green light. He turned right in front of me. I tried to swerve to the left. He kept coming. I hit him in the front, the the front passenger side. And that's it. I got two witnesses that said you ran the red light. Besides, not even these guys. That's I'm gonna tell you it's not true. I had the green light. Okay. One of them has a dash cam. So. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to write you a ticket for the surveying the traffic light. Did you see the dash cam? Huh? Did you see the dash I'm cam? I'm still gonna have to write it. Okay. So, all right, let these guys take care of you, okay? Yeah, I just need your information. You, you don't want to go to the hospital? No, I think okay. Oh, I'm going to need the actual car key. Uh, that, that hurt a lot. Um, no, sneezing. <laughs> sneezing was painful. I mean, it's almost like Spoon is trying to make himself look like the victim while completely neglecting the possibility that someone might have been killed due to his reckless nature. Just take a look at how people reacted to this footage and how they began to despise him by mocking him in various ways. First, actual content in years. Could this vlog be a new trend for the old man? Is this the Spoonie movie we have been waiting for? Spoonie's most realistic content yet could be prelude to the movie. LOL, he said he didn't need to go to a hospital, which is surprising when you consider his history of poor health. I'm shocked Noah didn't just fall apart like a Jenga tower when the cars collided. Believe it or not, this car accident would be the least problematic thing that would happen to Spoonie that year, because by the end of 2019, he had broken up with April and also faced foreclosure on his house because of his inability to pay the mortgage. Yes, there's a lot of new information to dissect here, but first things first. Regarding the breakup, we don't have all the details. Although Noah frequently vented on Twitter, he never disclosed personal information to this extent. From what I understand, the prevailing opinion is that a breakup occurred sometime before Christmas in 2019. As for his housing situation, he failed to meet his mortgage payments. This also means that he not only lost his down payment, but also all the additional money he had invested in the house, and consequently he was forced to leave his home. His home's been listed for sale on Realtor.com as a short sale. And what this means is that they're actually selling it for less than Spoonie paid. It's an absolute fire sale on Spoonie's home. They're going to take offers way below listing. And that means Spoonie is going to lose his down payment. He's going to lose every month of payments that he paid in. And he's probably years behind on payments also. But here's the home. It's for fucking sale. It's a short sale. It's in the thumbnail of this video. What the, what the home looked like before he moved in, and what it looks like now. Here it is, all American home, four bedroom, two, two bath. The lawn's well manicured, it's well maintained, fresh coat of paint on it. Now let's have a look at what it looks like in fucking 2020. Here is the home, look at the lawn. It's disheveled. The paint looks faded. It looks peeling. There's a basketball hoop that's never used. Look at the look at the driveway. All he had to do was keep making videos talking in a camera about movies and video games. All he had to do was do once a month a Cards Against Humanity live stream that he was paid $600 for. During this period, Spoonie posted another notorious tweet which reads as follows. I'm looking into renting a truck for my move back to Arizona. I rented a truck for my move to Aurora, towing my car behind, but I'm afraid of doing it that way again. I don't know if it's just my confidence being shattered after my car accident or what. You might think why this tweet gained so much negative attention, but I think this Reddit comment explains it very effectively. I don't know if it's just my confidence being shattered after my car accident or what. You mean the car accident you caused by running a red light nearly killed two people and straight up lied to a police officer in spite of witness statements claiming otherwise? 
that car accident, the one you couldn't even be bothered to show up at your hearing after you made a video about exaggerating your injuries and calling it a learning experience. Go fuck yourself, Spoonie. Hope you end up hiking back to Arizona. Yeah, pretty much. So, what happened after that? Well, the prevailing belief is that Noah returned to live with his parents following the loss of his house. However, I couldn't verify this information personally. Nevertheless, it appears to be the consensus among people online. Adding to these tragic circumstances, Spoonie's beloved dog, the one for whom he created a Twitter account, also passed away, undoubtedly adding further strain to his mental health. It appeared that Noah has lost almost all of the sources of happiness in his life essentially confining himself to his house and rarely going outside. It's worth noting that he was somewhat of a shut-in even during his time with April, but now things appear to be worse than ever. His Twitter account also turned into a source of absolute misery, with constant tweets expressing sadness and loneliness. He lamented about the past, such as his relationship with April and the death of his dog. The gloomy atmosphere on his Twitter feed had become so pessimistic that someone actually created the Spoonie said tweet generator. This project that is shared on GitHub randomly generates a tweet that looks like Spoonie might make it. This stuff is so accurate that when I first heard about it, I mistook it for his actual Twitter account. The detrimental impact of depression on Spoonie's life was most seen in his live streams. At this point, he barely had the strength to maintain eye contact with the camera, most of the time he didn't even talk during the gameplay. This continued until September of 2020, when he went live for his Death Stranding livestream. However, before devolving into the session, he addressed his audience about his new health issues. I've, I had bronchitis for like, seriously six months straight. Um. And this was right around the same time I had the car accident where I broke some ribs, which that was fun. It wasn't fun. Uh, my voice is uh, not the same. Surprisingly, he decided to keep the comments visible on this video, a move that showcased the evident division within his community. Some individuals expressed well wishes and hope for a swift recovery, while others reprimanded him for a variety of reasons. It is clear that Spoonie still has both adoring fans and vehement critics. But the real reason why this livestream is important for us is because Noah didn't post any content after that for almost a year and a half. From September 23rd of 2020 to May 18th of 2022, his channel remained completely inactive. He hinted on Twitter that he wasn't doing well, likely indicating that he was taking a break from the internet. People had nearly lost hope for him until he resumed streaming after this long pause. As one might imagine, some optimistic fans believed that this could be the actual comeback of Spoonie One, especially considering he began streaming more frequently and sounded more much better. However, many were less enthusiastic when observing his streams. First and foremost, there was no longer camera recording him and there was no concrete updates on whether he would return to creating reviews. In the grand scheme of things, not much really changed, he simply continued streaming and that was it. An interesting turn of events unfolded by the end of 2022 when Paul Morgan reached out to Spoonie for an interview. If you are unfamiliar with this person, Paul Morgan Settler is an actor who played Curtis Craig in Phantasmagoria 2, a video game that significantly contributed to Spoonie's immense popularity through his acclaimed gameplay videos. It is a fascinating twist of fate that these two individuals would connect, especially considering that this might be the singular event in quite some time that brings Spoonie some relevance. The interview proceeded as one might expect, with Paul asking questions about Noah's life as well as his online career, without devolving too deeply into personal issues. One segment of this video would be particularly important for the discussion in the comments, because Spoonie stated the following. Yeah, so I just was saying that um, there's a lot of ways that we can go with this, and I'm curious where you're at with your your you know career right now and what your your goal is to kind of get back into the swing of things. 
things got bad for me for a while. Um, it's my goal of ultimately to start making reviews again. Okay. Um, it's been a long way to the. It's been a long way try, trying to climb my way back to where I can even appear on camera again. It was almost something in the realm of fiction when Spoonie mentioned that he might create legitimate content in the near future. This one statement from him generated a lot of comments under the video. To fully grasp the mentality of his fans, let's take a look at some discussions and this particular comment and its replies provide us with a perfect representation of this. Dragon Slayer Prod commented, It's my goal, ultimately, to start making reviews again. That's all I wanted to hear from him. One of the responses says, I wonder if he'll ever address the whole Patreon debacle, to which another user responded, All is forgiven, I don't care, his old content brings me fun to this day, I just want him to make good content again. This response showcases the extent of delusion and denial that his dedicated fans are currently experiencing. They do not care about the money Spoonie stole, his lies and deceit, or how he undermined his career by doing nothing while squandering the money other people gave him to create content. None of that matters to them. All they want is for Spoonie to come back. And when I say Spoonie, I mean the actual creator, not this desolate, decaying shell of a man that seems to wallow in self-misery. And considering that this interview took place more than a year ago, do you think he actually followed through with this promise? Well, to answer this question, let's take a look at some of the replies to that comment we just discussed earlier. Six months after the interview, user by the name of Jay Skeezy commented this. Wish granted, his new uploads are just old works he did over a year ago. Comments are disabled still, thankfully. So, glad he's back. Betrayal. Reality check. Dude literally stole thousands of dollars from his supporters without a valid reason. On top of him existing here, still doing bargain bin quality let's plays, why does anybody hold this dude in a high light still? And if you were to take a look at his channel, we would see that that is absolutely correct. Even up to the moment of this recording, Spoonie's recent videos consist of re-uploads of his past work, meaning he still hasn't produced any piece of genuine content. The response of the original commentator is, take your hate dick somewhere else bro. And Jay Skeezy responded, I'm curious if you have actual valid points backing up Spoonie's theft slash betrayal, or are you literally saying that depression gives anybody the right to be a narcissist? That last sentence is really important, because Spoonie has been using the shield of depression and health problems for almost 10 years now. I am not denying that having mental issues is a huge problem, and if someone is suffering from problems, they should focus more on themselves. But Spoonie was playing this game for far too long now. He was too depressed to make YouTube videos that demanded actual effort, but he still left his Patreon up and took money from the people that expected him to work on something. His Patreon is up to this day and he still generates small amount of money from there. He played the depression card for far too long, at this point the excuses have run out. The major question that is probably lingering in everybody's mind is what is Spoonie currently doing? Well, he still live streams on YouTube, has a new dog and occasionally appears as a guest on Paul's channel where they engage in let's plays. So basically, not much has changed over these years and it's unlikely that much will. To grasp the extent to which Noah's career has sunk, let's compare some numbers. These are the average numbers of views Noah gets for his live streams. And this is that darn Irish man, a YouTuber who creates videos on various subjects but primarily focuses on internet's favorite punching bag, Boogie2988. This is what people are talking about? I'm sorry Tommy C, I'm sorry Daddy Came Star. I'm sorry, no. Oh. oh my god, the one time I wish you guys like, could see my face. Is it more pathetic that he's wearing a like, Star Wars t-shirt? <laughs> During his live streams, he often reacts to Boogie's content along with his audience. The screenshot you are currently watching shows that darn Irishman's average views for his live streams. Now, if we were to compare these two channels, a certain disparity in numbers becomes obvious. Irishman appears to be missing a few zeros in his subscriber count, yet he manages to get more views on his live streams than Noah. 
When we examine the history of Spoonie's online presence, a notable trend emerges in his behavior. From his insistence on making videos that the majority of the audience didn't want to watch to his strong reactions to criticism, it is obvious that in his mind Spoonie always comes first. He never cared about the feedback and he didn't hesitate to lie such as when he promised to make the Spoonie one movie. When he was too depressed to work, he didn't mind that his Patreon was still active, taking money from from people even when he failed to fulfill all of his promises and at one point didn't upload anything on YouTube for more than a year and a half. No one can deny that Spoonie had the opportunity to become big on YouTube. He had the potential to even surpass Doug Walker himself. There is no doubt in my mind that if he got his act together and started posting reviews tomorrow, his audience would surely come back to cheer him on. But he simply won't do it, he just doesn't care. For him, any excuse for not working is good enough. And that is why Noah Entweiler, the Spoony one, has fewer people watching his streams than a YouTuber with less than 4,000 subscribers. It has been more than 10 years since he left Channel Awesome to pursue his dreams on his own. And at the end of the day, when you are alone, there really is only one person to blame for your failings. At this point in time, the promise of a Spoonie One movie is just a distant memory. And soon, so too will be the persona of who Noah Entweiler used to be.